You're calling me over You're pulling me close With love you surround me You give me hope Yeah, yeah Bro. 
scripture from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I'd like for you to join with me as we pray. Lord, we pray that you will heal all those who have been diagnosed with the coronavirus. We pray in faith, believing they will recover totally. They will recover rapidly and they will have no long-term complications in their bodies from this illness. We ask you to heal them in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to comfort those who are living in fear of getting the coronavirus. Your word says, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Let us be ever mindful that you are still on the throne and that you are still in control. We pray for our president and for our governor and for all of the elected officials that are dealing with the virus. We ask you to give them godly wisdom in all the decisions they are making concerning the eradic eradication of the virus. Let them be mindful that they are your servants sent to do good to your people. Lord, we pray for the healthcare professionals who are on the front line dealing with the virus. We pray for their protection from the virus. Lord, we pray that you would build a hedge of protection around all of us and shield us from this coronavirus. We acknowledge that God is our refuge and strength and an ever-present help in times of trouble. We pray all of these things in the powerful and mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for our congregation. Lord, we pray for those at Liberty Church who need a touch from you this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would touch them if they need a physical healing, that you would touch them if they need a spiritual touch, if they need an emotional touch, or Lord, even if they need a financial blessing. We pray today, God, that you would touch them by the power of your mighty Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for all of the good things that you are doing at Liberty Church. Lord, we thank you, God, that you're making disciples, Lord, and you're, you're bringing people who want to serve you and want to be a part of what you're doing in this important hour. Lord, we thank you again for all the many ways that you have blessed us. We thank you, God, that you are always there for us, that we can turn to you in every situation and you never turn a deaf ear to us. We thank you, God, today for answering our prayers. And Lord, we just pray all of these things and we believe for victory in all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We're in a series of sermons entitled Messages from the Cross. Jesus spoke seven last messages while hanging on the cross at Calvary. He hung there for six hours between heaven and earth. And this morning, we're going to look at the fifth message that Jesus spoke from the cross, and it was simply, I thirst. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 19, and I'm going to read just one verse of Scripture, and it's verse 28, and I'm reading from the New King James Bible. The Bible says, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. If we examine that verse very carefully, we will all probably question what is meant by after this. Our inquisitive mind would ask, after what? Well, the answer is this. The after this included everything that transpired from the beginning of Passover at six o'clock on Thursday evening until Jesus died on the cross at three o'clock in the evening on Friday. The night before Jesus was crucified on Calvary's cross was without question 
a time that was filled with some of the most monumental and historical and spiritual events that have ever occurred on the face of the earth. Obviously, there are some people today who would look at these events as an exciting fairy tale, but it wouldn't mean anything to them. The Bible says that Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. To them, everything about Jesus is a hoax. And needless to say, we need to continue to pray that their eyes would be open to the things of Jesus and he would be come to be their personal Lord and Savior. But I can tell you that without reservation, all of the events that happened at that time unfolded in real life. And they unfolded with real life characters. And that was some 2,000 years ago. And it all took place on a hill called the Place of the Skull outside of Jerusalem. And we often refer to that as Golgotha or Calvary. The events of the day began when Jesus sent Peter and John to prepare for the Passover meal. When the time came, Jesus sat down, the Bible said, with his 12 disciples, and he celebrated the Passover meal in the upper room. It was during that time that he got up from the table. The Bible says he took off his robe, and he took a towel, and he tied it around his waist, and he took a basin and poured some water in the basin, and then he proceeded to wash the feet of his disciples and dry them with the towel that was around his waist. He even washed the feet of Judas, who a few hours later was going to betray him. After supper, Jesus and his disciples went to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was there that he began to be sorrowful and troubled, and his soul was overwhelmed to the point of death. And this is what he prayed. He said, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. The Bible says that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. While he was still speaking to the disciples, Judas came with a large crowd. And they were all carrying swords and clubs. Peter who always acted on impulse, drew his sword. And the Bible says he cut the right ear off one of the priest's servants, a man by the name of Malchus. Jesus said, put away your sword, Peter. He said, if I wanted to, I could call my father and ask him, and he would send thousands of angels to protect us. And he would do it instantly. Jesus was well aware that he was on a mission and he was going to the cross to fulfill all the things that the scriptures had prophesied would take place. It was all about being obedient to his father for Jesus. He was doing exactly what the father had said to do. One of the greatest ways that you and I can honor our God is to obey his word. The Bible tells us to be doers of the word, to obey the word, not just to listen to the word, but to do what the word said. It wasn't long before the Sanhedrin guard came and they arrested Jesus and they dragged him from place to place, from trial to trial, all during the night and even into the early morning. He was severely beaten, he was ridiculed and he was mocked and he was stripped naked and he was nailed to a cross between two hardened criminals. After all of these events had taken place, our text tells us that Jesus knew that all things were now accomplished. How did he know that? How did he know that all things were accomplished? He knew it because he was God in the flesh. It's beyond our comprehension that he was fully man, yet he never stopped being God. He knew everything because as God he was omniscient. He was all knowing. He knew the precise plans of God 
even before the foundation of the world. He knew when every single detail of his mission here on earth had been accomplished. At some point in time between Passover and when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that he prayed for himself. It's okay if we pray for ourselves. We do a lot of praying for other people, but sometimes we just need to pray for ourselves. And Jesus did that. And here's what he prayed. He said, Father, I have glorified you. And he meant by that, when he said he had glorified the Father, that he had worshiped him, that he had honored him, and that he obeyed him while he was on this earth. And then he said something extremely important. He said, I have finished the work which you sent me to do. The work that you have given me to do. You see, God has given each one of us some kind of work. We often call it a ministry. And he's given us that ministry or that work to advance his kingdom here on this earth. And one of these days, we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account of what we have done in the flesh. I'm hoping at that time we can all say, as Jesus said, Father, I have finished the work that you sent me to do. We don't want to be like the church at Sardis in the book of the Revelation. The Bible said that they were good starters, but they just didn't finish anything. And we want to finish the work that Jesus gave us to do. Jesus' mission had essentially began in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and sin and death came into the world, God promised a savior. Satan was going to bruise the heel of Jesus, but Jesus was going to crush his head. The Bible says, but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. And that's exactly what he did on Calvary. was 12 years of age, he was well aware that he was on a mission for his father. This is what he said when his mother and dad had left him after celebrating the Passover in Jerusalem. They went back to look for him and they found him and he was with all the teachers and, and the doctors and, uh, and this is what he said to them. He said this, he said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? He knew that the father had sent him for a reason and he was about the father's business. He was about the business of doing the mission that his father sent him to do. When he began his public ministry, the Bible says he was led in the, by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan came to him and tempted him. And he tempted him in the three ways that you and I are tempted. He tempted him with the lust of the flesh. He tempted him with the lust of the eyes, and he tempted him with the pride of life. Jesus faced every temptation that Satan and the forces of darkness could have possibly thrown at him, and he won the victory. The Bible says he did not sin. He was without sin. Listen to what Jesus said. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. He said he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and to be a ransom for many. Jesus knew that he had performed every single act of obedience that his father had outlined for him in the law and in the prophets. He knew that he had paid the price as the sacrificial lamb of God for every sin, past, present, and future. There was nothing else to do. There was no more redemptive work for him to accomplish. There was nothing else to do for him beyond the cross. Nothing was necessary for our salvation. He did it all. No one can work their way into the kingdom of God. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough good things. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. And this not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. None of works so that no man can boast. All things have been accomplished by Jesus.
Jesus had been nailed on the cross at nine in the morning. And for six hours, he hung there bleeding and suffering and dying. And his thoughts were all directed to the people that were around him that day. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was only mindful of man. King David said this to God. He says, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son, the son of man that you care for him. When Jesus was on the cross, all of the people standing there and you and I were on his mind. It was 2,000 years ago, but he was thinking about you and he was thinking about me when he died on Calvary's cross. What he accomplished on the cross was for you and me. Jesus was thinking about the people who had crucified him. And what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He was thinking about the man who was hanging next to him. The criminal, the criminal who had repented and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He was thinking about his mother and about the disciple that he loved. And he said to his mother, behold, this is your son. And then he said to John, behold, your mother. He was thinking about how he had, be he had, began, hey, he had become the final sacrifice for sin. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus didn't ask anything for himself until all things had been accomplished. Only when he accomplished his mission did Jesus yield to his physical pain. And he did so with two words. He said, I thirst. It's the only time on the cross that Jesus was mindful of his own needs. There's no doubt about it. He was, he was physically thirsty. He probably hadn't had anything to drink since he had celebrated the Passover. They tried to offer him some wine that was mixed with myrrh, but it was somewhat of a sedative and he refused that because he wanted to be in complete control of himself when he was on the cross. Psalm 22 is a prophecy about the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is what it says about Jesus as he hung there. He said, my strength has dried up like sun-baked clay, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Was he totally man? Absolutely. Jesus was physically thirsty, but his thirst was much more than physical. Even on the cross, Jesus thirsted for the souls of men and women. He didn't want anybody to perish, but he wanted everyone to come to repentance. He thirsted to be thirsted after. He thirsted to be thirsted after. Listen to what he said to the woman at the well. Everyone who drinks this water, this well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never ever thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Who hunger and thirst. And then he followed that up by saying, They will be filled. When Jesus said, I thirst, he was reminding us that we too have needs. We get the idea that we can do this thing called life all on our own. The coronavirus has made us keenly aware that we are not only weak, we are helpless and we are thirsty. It has brought us to our knees in more ways than one. If we had been standing at the foot of the cross that day when Jesus said, I am thirsty, we would have, we would have been willing to give him a drink in a heartbeat. We can still give him a drink. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. He said, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. He said, I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was in prison 
And you came to visit me. And somebody stands in there and says, Lord, when did we do that? When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we ever see you as a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it unto me. We have opportunity. We have tremendous opportunity today because there are people everywhere that are thirsty. It's true, we have to stay six feet away. But we can still, we can still take advantage of the situation today. The coronavirus is leaving a path of destruction, but it will pass. And when it does, the doors will open wide for you and me to reach all of those people that are thirsty. And it will begin when you and I cry out, I thirst. I thirst for more of Jesus Christ. I thirst for more of his way. The French mathematician and Christian philosopher Blaise Pascal said this. He said there's a God-shaped hole inside of every man that only Jesus Christ can fill. There are people today all around us who are thirsty. They're thirsty. And they have no idea what they're thirsty for. But I'm here to tell you today, they're thirsty for Jesus. And it's an awesome opportunity for you and me to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And to help them fill their need for thirst. Amen. Maybe you're thirsty today. Maybe you're saying, I'm that person that Pascal was talking about. I've got that God-shaped hole. I've tried to fill it with everything. I've tried to fill it with things, and it didn't work. I've tried to fill it with alcohol and drugs. Every imaginable thing, and it didn't work. You can fill it with Jesus today. The Bible says, if we will confess Him as Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. We will be saved. And your thirst will be quenched. And the hole that is there will be filled. And it will be filled with Jesus Christ. Is it that easy? Absolutely. But I'm telling you today, it will change your whole life. Because once Jesus comes in here, you're going to want to be a disciple. You're going to want to learn more about him so that you can serve him in a greater way. Amen. Thank you for listening. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You Me. Oh.